Welcome back to the Manor, Julian McBain here, and we are back with Personal Finance for Gamers. And as we are going to be doing Mayhem at the same time, I will unfortunately be just a little bit more distracted this time around. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the concept of pay yourself first. And this is a concept that I know a lot of people have heard. It's a very common concept in finance, especially budgeting and personal finance. And I think it's a concept that a lot of people don't quite... I think people think of it incorrectly in a lot of ways, or they don't put enough emphasis behind it because I didn't at first. Uh, and then when I started using the concept and using it correctly, and that's always the important part, it's using the concept correctly, I found that rebuilding the finances that I had so badly damaged, trying to use fancy language and that ain't working, um, things came together much more cohesively. So we're going to get into the concept of pay yourself first and what it really means. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the manor. Please take a moment and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time. So make sure you subscribe. Also, please consider going to patreon.com slash Julian McBain if you want to support my work. If you do, you'll get exclusive content, including a patrons only video every single month. Some comments from me from time to time and of course you get put on the credits list for my videos so i appreciate all of the support of my patrons let's get started so paying yourself first there's a, there's a lot of ways people take this it's some people use it to remind themselves to set themselves money aside to have a treat every month which is important but this is the wrong application of the term some use it to build their savings that's the correct application of the term Others think it means to go out and buy something frivolous every week. Again, incorrect application of the term. So what pay yourself is real pay yourself first is really about is not about spending. It's about building a savings habit. Now I know on my old personal finance for gamers threat or um, playlist, you'll find building a savings habit is one of the videos there. I might even uh, put it in this playlist later so that you can have easy access to it. But it's about making sure you're putting money aside every single month, week, pay period, whatever, so that you have a growing savings. That way if something happens and something critical happens, you can dip you have a you have a cash reserve that's not credit based. When you're getting started, especially if you're deep in debt, this is critically important. The other part of this is, is as you build your finances and you're able to start moving away from debt retirement into investment, you'll already have the necessary habits to remind you to actually invest properly instead of saying, oh, I'm out of debt. Let's go spend a bunch of extra money. Because from me to you, the temptation is there. So we're going to go through all the various saving vehicles, so to speak, the different places you can put stuff. A couple of concepts that you might want to address and think about. Things to decide when budgeting the money that you will be setting aside. And keeping in mind that everyone's personal situation is different. And you are going to have to tailor your own budget to your own capabilities. Using these concepts as a foundation for what you're doing will make it easier for you to build your savings in the future. And it doesn't mean you're going to be super successful at first. In fact, you're probably going to misstep several times before this becomes a good habit. Before you don't find yourself having to move all of the money you saved into your checking account because you misbudgeted. Shit happens. That's part of the process. But as long as you keep the savings habit up and you don't let yourself repeat mistakes, it's going to be far less detrimental to your finances. Okay. First thing that we're going to address today is retirement plans. There will be a whole video on the various retirement plans, the, the positives and the negatives, how they work. This is not about mechanics. This is about the setting of money aside. So many of you will have jobs that will have retirement plans, especially if you're in the United States. If you are in Europe, I know many countries have pension plans and things like that. You'll have to talk to your own equivalent of human resources whoever handles those plans to figure out how that would go uh, i know many of those are government run and so this would not necessarily apply to you unless your country has this type of a or a similar plan to one of these so let's talk about 
um, first 401k and 403b. 401k is the one that is the most common. 403b is more complicated. We'll get into that more in the retirement video, the video about retirement plans, which is down the road. Um, but basically, they both work thusly. They're defined contribution accounts. That means you put in a certain amount every paycheck, and it goes into the account, and it's pre-tax. The standard is pre-tax. So before taxes are taken out of your salary, they remove this money from your salary. It means that you're not paying taxes on the money that goes into these plans. Benefits to a tax advantage account, it lowers your taxable income for the year. If This could be very important, especially if you're on a tax threshold. It could actually drop you out of a whole tax bracket, which, which could be advantageous to your take-home income on the back end. On the other hand, that's not always the case. And you can't access the money except for certain qualifying events until you are 59 and a half. Now, for many people, this is a non-issue. If you are in a position where every dollar counts and you're trying to just get that baseline, this can create problems. So 401ks and 403bs are good. Talk to a financial advisor before you commit a large amount of money to them. This, there, this is paired with one other issue, and this is something that, generally speaking, is the correct way to do it. And I know that every, every first off, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not providing you financial advice. Speak to your financial advisor for your specific needs. But a good idea is, if at all possible, contribute whatever your employer is matching. So in, you might have an employer that will match you up to 3% of your salary. You put 3% of your salary or wages into the 401k. The employer then puts an additional 3% into, into the 401k. If you don't do that, you're leaving money on the table. Now, there are certain circumstances where you have to. If you are budgeted to the hilt and you don't have an extra five cents at the end of the month, of course, you're going to have to forego that for a while. It's not good, but it's understandable. On the other hand, if you can contribute the max of the match, max out the match. When you max out the match, you're getting the maximum amount. It's like having a 3% raise or a 6% raise. Um, there are companies that pay as much as 6% match. So if you have the opportunity to get those dollars, get the dollars. After a couple of weeks, you'll forget you even had the extra 6%. And a lot of those retirement funds, especially 401ks, depending on the plan that you're in, a lot of those plans allow you to take out loans against the 401k. And the interest goes back into the 401k. So... You're basically borrowing from yourself and paying interest back to yourself to fund an emergency. Uh, that is not an endorsement of 401k lo loans, but sometimes they are necessary. Um, beyond those two, you also have the individual retirement account. Again, there's going to be whole videos on this. The individual retirement account has the benefit of not having to move it from company to company when you move jobs. The downside is it's very limited on what you can put into it. I believe it's still $5,500 a year for the average person, $6,500 once you're above a certain age. That might be pegged to inflation. So we, I, fact check me on the current numbers, but that's the way it was when I was trained in it. Um, and you won't get a match for an IRA. Now, IRAs can have a lot more creative investment options. And again, talk to a financial advisor about your individual needs. However, there's the limitations of an IRA versus an individual retirement account, an IRA versus, say, a 401k, may not justify having one over what your company provides you for retirement. Now, if your company doesn't provide you retirement options, the IRA is the way to go. And there are other less common ones, like a simple or a SEP that I could talk about. We're not getting into the weeds today. They do exist. They have their place, especially in small businesses, but those are very specific product lines, and that's not the purpose of this video uh, just to touch on to finish up retirement the retirement portion because retirements are what most people think about when they think pay yourself first but it's not necessarily it's not the most it's not necessarily the best use of the phrase pay yourself first it's an important part of it but there's another piece to it Roth the word Roth means that the money that goes into the retirement account is after tax. So on a, on a traditional 401k, 
the money that goes in is pre-tax. You don't pay taxes on the money that goes into the 401k. You put the money into the 401k and then they tax you on the rest. On a Roth, they tax you on your income and then you take out of that in that net income to put into the 401k. And you're thinking, Julian, what's the purpose of that? Well, the benefit to that is when you have a traditional 401k, you're not taxed on the money in the 401k until you pull the money out. This includes money you put in when you initially put it in, that's your cost basis, and the money you take out uh, that you earned while it was in there through um, capital gains and, dividend and dividends. The money will grow over time. This is why it's very important that if you have access to retirement accounts, you start at the age of 18 because you are going to save much more money over that time period and you're much less likely to get inflation out as many people are right this second in 2021. So that's important to know. The benefit to a Roth is you put the money in, it's after tax, and most money's first in, first out. If I remember correctly, it's either they only tax the money on the dividends or, and I believe this is actually the case, they don't tax any of it because you already paid taxes on the initial money that went in. Um, now, the tax code can change at any time. The IRS is really good at screwing with people, so be aware of that. Um, again, not financial advice, not tax advice. This is supposed to be informational, but be aware that those options exist. And most importantly, always talk to a financial advisor first. And I can't express that enough. A working financial advisor who has up-to-the-minute regulatory um, information is your best defense against screwing it up. A CPA is also really good to have if you're in the position to need one. Most, Many of the people watching this will not need a certified public accountant except for a tax time. Um, but the tax advice you can get from one could be life-changing, frankly. Okay. So having set that piece aside, and that's a form of automatic savings, but that savings you can't touch. And the problem with that is, is life happens, right? The problem with, and this is the problem with retirements generally. Retirements generally are basically designed under the assumption that you can't be responsible enough to handle your own money. And so the government needs to lock it away or they, they have to have the, the banks create an account type where you're regulated away from using it. And to a certain extent, there's a lot of, that's why they give you all the benefits. They know they're locking you out of a part of their, your income. And so they give you some form of back end benefit to counterbalance that regulatory risk that you're taking. Because if you take money out of a 401k and you're under the age of 59 and a half, then you end up paying 10% tax plus a 10% penalty. So it's, it gets double taxed and that's, that's not good for you. And if it's a Roth, that means you're getting double taxed on money that was already taxed. So I don't know if that rule applies. I know the penalty applies to Roth. Maybe it's only the penalty that gets applied to Roth. Fact check me on that. <clears throat> Never been a real fan of Roths. Uh, the, but that's just me. Um, so, okay. Start an automatic savings. What that means is Go into your bank. If you don't have one already, start a savings account. Put the minimum deposit in. Don't touch that money. Then you set up an automatic savings plan. What that means is once a week, once a month, once a pay period, doesn't matter. You put in a certain amount of money. And it just automatically rolls over every month, every week, every two weeks. doesn't matter. And it builds that account up. Now you want that account to be sacred. You don't want to be touching that money unless shit's gone seriously south, okay? And the goal for that account is to, at minimum to make $1,000. Dave Ramsey really goes into the $1,000 savings. He says, block it off at 1,000 and then just pour everything into debt. There's a certain wisdom to that. I don't necessarily agree with Dave on that, but he's also been doing this longer than I have and it works. Uh, I can actually attest that it does work because I have a great uncle. He and my aunt use the Dave Ramsey method and it does work. Uh, there are risks involved with using that method, especially if an emergency uh, crops up. So you take the good with the bad. So what are the, the mechanisms by which you can create this automatic savings plan? Well, first you can just set up a standard transfer to a savings account from your checking in your normal bank. The benefit to this, it's easy to do. Your banker will love you and it shows the bank that you're being responsible. So if you decide to go after a credit product later, 
you've got that that extra history with them. The downside is, is it makes it really accessible. And when money's accessible and you see the shiny thing on a shelf or you're really kind of jonesing for a pizza or your significant other's there going, take me on a date, it makes the money really accessible. So what do you do? You can use a couple of different options. Honestly, the best one to do is open an account at a different bank. And I know all the banker friends I have at the bank I used to work at are probably cringing if they were actually watching this channel. But the fact of the matter is, is that by doing so, it makes it harder for you to access because you can transfer from one bank to another automatically in a lot of cases. Uh, alliances like Zelle or using uh, different apps to move the money around makes it harder for you to access or it can't be an immediate thing. You have to wait time to get that money. So in a lot of merge emergencies, you're gonna have to make a big payment, but you're not gonna get the bill for a week or two. That makes life easy. You can now move the money or you can go down to the other branch, take the money out and put it into your checking account. Cool, cool. The downside is, is that it doesn't help you if you're stuck out on the highway somewhere. Uh, take the good with the bad. It, it really does help build the savings habit, habit to have it in a different financial institution. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have one with your, your home bank. Having some sort of a savings at your, home, at your main bank as like an overdraft protection to protect you in case something goes sour and it doesn't overdraft your account, which induces huge penalties, relatively large penalties, is a good thing to have. On the other hand, keeping that extra money separate into a quote unquote sacred account, that's a Grant Cardonism, that helps you build your money up. And that's what the goal of paying yourself first is. So maybe you set a couple of goals and you're like, okay, goal number one is to have enough money set aside in an account that's associated with my main bank to protect against overdraft. And I don't touch that money, it always stays there. Let's call it a $500 account. And you build that up over several months. Okay, fine, you got that $500 set aside, good to go. Now you go to another bank, take your minimum deposit in, put the money in, and that's your sacred account. No matter what the circumstances, unless something catastrophic happens, you don't touch that money. The purpose of that money is to build up your finances. So put that money into that, ba into that bank. You, do, you have an auto move once a month, or you have to walk into the bank, depending on the bank or credit union, and you put the money in. And I'm gonna universally use the term bank instead of going bank or credit union, financial institution, whatever you wanna call it. Not all of these things are going to be banks. They're going to be FDI insured banks, uh, NCUA insured credit unions or SPIC insured uh, broker dealers. I'm using the term bank as a colloquial, colloquialism because it's just easier to say. Um, there are other options you can use too, and they're all associated with other financial institutions. And I'm not, I use several of what I'm going to mention. I am not. Uh, sponsored by any of the people I'm mentioning now. However, these can be used as tools to help you save. Um, you've got long game savings, which opens you a savings account at one of two or three financial institutions. You actually have to open the account with the other institution. It's all done online and it helps you build and, the, and it gamifies savings to help you build your finances up and make you reluctant to pull money out of it. It, it really works. Uh, it's, a, it's a great program. That's one thing you can use. And yes, I will kind of evangelize that one. That's my main savings vehicle. I have found it works really, really well. The bank that is associated, the, the affiliate bank that I use is a, uh, a really good financial institution. So um, the big thing is, is it gamifies savings. And for gamers like us, Gamifying savings is how we're going to win the game. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you are into crypt, if you're into to something with a little more risk, want it on the market, then Stash or Robinhood are good options. Those are um, stock buying apps that allow you to buy fractional shares. Again, when it comes to buy, uh, buying stocks and or bonds, please talk to a financial advisor or do a metric shitload of research. All of the stuff that I do on it, and I do use one of those too, 
is because I use stash. Uh, it just happened to be the one that I found. Bef um, the reason that I do things the way I do is because I have the experience that may or may not be the best option for you. It might be better that you go to a traditional broker dealer and set up what they call a drip. It goes into a mutual fund. A financial advisor will help you with set all of that up. There's minimum payments and stuff like that that might apply, but that can help too. And you can set that up with a broker dealer. Um, and a lot of broker dealers have their own self-directed investment um, programs. I know that Wells Fargo does. I'm 99.9% .9 sure JP Morgan and Chase does. I'm almost positive B of A does. So Bank of America does. So any of those, and again, I'm not sponsored by any of these institutions, are options for you to build that savings up. Another one that works, and I was actually very surprised that this worked, is if you're into crypto, you can use crypto to build your savings. Now, hold the phone for a second. Crypto is very volatile, especially relative to the other options mentioned. Very volatile. And there are a number of different um, cryptos you can, you can pick up on. I'm not going to get into individual tokens. I do know that some of them actually you can stake your tokens for a return. And so, uh, and they can range anywhere from a regular savings amount, uh, USD coins like 0.15% APY, all the way up to I've seen 5% APY on a couple of more risky tokens. So, I mean, you're going to see the principle go up and down. So just be aware of that. This is not like a traditional savings, not at all. And it's even less like it than a broker dealer product or service. Because those go up and down too, but the returns on them are generally better than, say, a savings account. Uh, I say generally, that's that's almost universally the case unless an individual stock that you buy or a stock within a fund that you buy crashes. Um, but, and, and we'll get into that stuff later. But anyway, the the benefit is, is that you will likely ha be able to find something that ha provides a higher rate of return or yield than the savings account. The downside is, is you're putting your principal at risk and it's a much more significant risk than other vehicles. Uh, there is one other benefit to this and that's it gets your money out of the dollar in a very, and that's this is only applicable to this point in time and this could change by the time you're watching this video. This is being produced in 2021. It could be 2030 by now and this may not even apply anymore. Consider this to be a lesson to keep in your hat for when it does happen in the future because it will happen in the future it always does the benefit to things like this is that if you get your money out of the dollar the dollar inflates you're immune to that inflation and it doesn't mean you're not immune to the market fluctuations in that other vehicle but it means that the dollar inflation doesn't drain that piece of it different risks apply Speaking of which, another good app to, that you can use to build your savings that doesn't provide a rate of return and it is basically market-based is Glint. Um, and this allows you to buy gold in very small amounts, like microtransactions of gold. And the benefit to that is it gets your money out of fiat currency. Gold's never been worth zero. And it works just like a savings account, but it doesn't have any form of rate of return. So you're complete, it, all it does is it stores value. It locks in the wealth at the level that you put it in there because gold doesn't actually move. Uh, in theory, all monies move except gold. Gold does not move. Everything else moves around gold. So you see the price of gold go up? No, it just means the dollar's gone down. You see the price of gold go down? No, it just means the dollar's gone up. See how that works? And while that may not be... While they may, that may not be 100% factually accurate, it is effectively accurate. So it's basically de facto, even if it's not de jure, if that makes any sense. Okay, so the, the entire purpose of using one of these various options is to make it harder to dip into. You don't want it to be easy to dip into these funds. If you dip into these funds, you're completely hamstringing yourself and defeating the whole purpose of doing it. So do yourself a favor, don't make it easy to dip into these funds. And it doesn't require a lot of months to start. This is something that really took some time to knock into this hard skull. It doesn't take a lot to start. $5 a month, $10 a month. 
and you just kind of let it roll. And yeah, if you're only doing $10 a month, but that's only $120 a year. Yes, it's $120 a year and you're not spending and you've started saving it to the side. There are people where if they can put $5 a month aside, that's a miracle for them, but they've got to start the habit. You have to start the habit. And I know it might mean that things are a little tougher for you. And there are going to be things that you're going to have to start sacrificing. But in the beginning, that's what you do. And a lot of those sacrifices are things that people use for self-medication. Smoking, drinking, those things that they help take the edge off after a stressful week of nonsense that I know you put up with. Blue-collar workers, I'm looking at you. Been there, done that. And I don't mean that to, to, to put it to the side. I'm, seriously. Like, grocery. The nicotine helps. It helps a lot. Um... But it's also a lot of money out of your pocket. And finding ways to cope with the stress without the expensive habit will help. And again, I'm not looking down on people who smoke. Used tobacco for years. I miss cigars. I really do. But it is an expensive habit. So just think about that as you're restructuring your finances through this series. You know, maybe you can cut back on them. Maybe not quit, but maybe cut back on them. Maybe switch to a brand that is of a lesser price. Uh, actually, there are several discount brands that were originally created to be premium brands, but no one in the premium brand market wanted to use them. So they switched to discount and they end up making a lot more money because their higher quality cigarette is selling for cheaper than the mainstream. I wish I was joking about that. So anyway, we're going to get off vices for now. The most important part of this is not the amount that you're saving at first. That will come with time. The point of this is to build the habit of setting the money aside. Build the habit of setting the money aside. So yeah, you're only doing $5 a month now. You've got a lot of debt. You don't have a lot of extra at the end of the month. So maybe you forego, you know, eating out once a month and put that money into the account. Or in all likelihood, you're you're skipping um I don't know, maybe maybe you're skipping out on a couple bottles of soda. 5 bucks. It's kind of sad that a couple small bottles of soda are 5 bucks now. Um it's a start. And eventually, you'll get over that small sacrifice. And I know there's a lot of people who will scoff, oh, you're just going on about Starbucks and avocado toast. No, first off, I like avocado toast. We'll leave Starbucks aside. It's not about that arrogant boomer fashion of ragging on our generation for liking the some of the things that we like that they never really did. It's about finding that thing you're willing to give up to build your future. And you're going to have to give up something. You know, sacrifice. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. I'm quoting Jordan Peterson. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. Here's the thing. You don't get to not sacrifice. That's the way it works. Okay. Um, I'm going to just touch on Dave. To, to wrap up, I'm, we're just going to touch on Dave Ramsey one more time. Uh, his website, if I remember correctly, is RamseySolutions.com. I'm going to double check that. Yes, RamseySolutions.com. His methodology does work. I have never used his methodology. I know people who have, and it works. Good extra reading after this. Don't agree with everything he preaches, but if I, I know for a fact he would not agree with everything I preach. Um, and honestly, if you agree with everything that someone that you know says, you're not thinking for yourself. So, okay, that's all we got. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time. So make sure you subscribe. And as always, I really appreciate the support, and we will see you in the next one.